Hello and welcome back to our course for the Christian Thought class at the Presbyterian Church of Bowling Green. We'll be looking at the great courses on, on philosophy of religion. Um, were we able to get together, this would be the video we would be watching. It is a series of lectures by this person, Professor James Hall. 40 years professor of epistemology and philosophy of religion at the University of Richmond. I will be summarizing the first three lectures in the series. What is philosophy? What is religion? And what is philosophy of religion? But before I do, let us open with a brief prayer. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us through another week. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of the Sabbath. Thank you, Lord, for time to be together and for fellowship, to have people we can talk to, walk with in our faith journey. Help us, Lord, to grow in understanding and in faith and guide us through the coming week. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, the first lecture, what is philosophy? Dr. Hall points out that philosophy is a rather loose term. We tend to toss it around somewhat frivolously at times. We might say, my philosophy is to live and let live, or something of that sort. Dr. Hall uses an example of two undergrad students he heard on campus one day, and one, first one said, what is your philosophy of education? And the second one said, well, I'm for it. And the first one said, that's a good philosophy. Now, I'd like to think that these two students were joking around, but Dr. Hall treats this as a serious conversation, and as an example of how just how loosely we do use the term philosophy. So he goes on to say, first of all, what philosophy is not. Philosophy is not just how you feel about things. It is not worldviews, although it can include discussion of worldviews. It may include meaning of life, but it is not only that. It is not just skepticism for its own sake. A lot of people have this idea that philosophy is just about arguing for the sake of arguing, arguing for fun even. Um, Dr. Hall uses that story from the church he visited where the pastor said, oh Lord, I'm, I know that there is a philosopher here among us and we pray that you will save us from people like that. But Dr. Hall obviously does not think we need to be saved from philosophy. And he does not think philosophy is simply attacking, simply arguing. Philosophy is not merely a collection of reflections and beliefs about this and that, no matter how systematic that collection might be. It is not inquiry in general. It was that at one time. There was a time when any advanced scholar was called a philosopher. And even to this day, we still refer to any, the very highest levels of scholarship as a PhD, a doctor of philosophy. Even if you have a doctor of philosophy in religion, in engineering, in physics, whatever. But philosophy is not just that anymore. And it is not just the history of ideas or the history of thought. Now, all of these are common definitions of philosophy, so if that was your definition, don't feel too bad. But, and even some of them are used academically. Uh, a lot of the introduction to philosophy textbooks that I've been given to teach to students over the years, 
have been much more about the history of philosophy, the history of Western thought. Um, it's a little bit, I think, like teaching art by looking at the history of art through the centuries, from the Greeks up through the 20th century and Andy Warhol and the various other, you know, the other postmodern and dribble artists and such. But it's not just that. And there's another interesting aspect about philosophy. Philosophy, as a word, means love of wisdom. So it's not defined by knowing a body of knowledge. You don't study a bunch of facts, and if you know them, you're a philosopher. Philosophy is about an attitude of love for wisdom. It's an activity, living that kind of life. There's kind of a early conflict there the, between back in the very beginnings of the days of philosophy in the days of Socrates, he had many, many debates with professional teachers who were called sophists, which is a Greek word that basically means sage or wise person. And the sophists were professional teachers who claimed to know everything and to be able to teach you whatever you wanted to learn, whether it was science or, or philosophy or law, anything. They would teach you for a price. Socrates, on the other hand, did not take money because he said he did not know anything. So he wasn't really a teacher. He was just a lover of wisdom, a lover of learning. Uh, and he further all, more went on to say that the wisest person is the one who claims, like he claims, not to know anything at all, but keeps seeking truth and keeps seeking to understand whatever can be understood. So there's that tension in philosophy. Philosophers believe that, the, most philosophers at least, believe there's something to learn. They wouldn't be philosophers otherwise. They would go work in a book. They'd go work in a retail store selling shirts. They'd, why spend your time doing philosophy if you don't think you're actually accomplishing anything? So they believe there's something to understand. There's something to learn. But at the same time, it's not just learning those facts and learning those answers. So that kind of gets back to Wayne's observation, is philosophy an art or is philosophy a science? And I suppose the answer is yes. Now Dr. Hall begins his series by looking at the sorts of questions people ask and say so which ones philosophers ask. He lists four types of questions. Questions of fact, how the world is. Is it raining outside? Well, you go look. Is it likely to rain next week? Well, you ask a scientist, a meteorologist, somebody who studies and knows things. Uh, questions of value, what is good? What should we do? That seems to be getting a little bit closer to philosophy, but it's not there yet. Uh, what should we do? Why? And then you've got more questions, but philosophy is not just questions of value. Um, it's not getting a little bit closer. It's not just questions of explanations or connections and relationships linking our descriptions and our values. It's not just exploring, okay, why is it raining outside? Why, why, how do you define rain? Is that a mist or is that a rain? Um, and so forth. We don't, it's not just looking at those connections. It's not looking, not just looking at 
those ideas, but it's, that's starting to get there. What there are, uh, there's these other kinds of questions called, which he calls meta questions, questions about questions. Looking at our assumptions, looking at our ways of thinking, looking at the concepts that we use when we ask questions about fact or value or explanation. And that's what he says philosophy is, these meta questions, these questions that underlie our other questions. If we say, what is good? Okay, well, what is good? What does it mean to say something is good? That's the kind of thing philosophers wonder about. How do you define good? Um, now, philosophy asks these questions in two sorts of modes. The first is analytic. We break down the bits. We look at very closely at how these concepts are used, what's the logic behind them and within them, what's the connections. And then once we've done all of this analysis, there's the synthetic part. You take all these little bits and you put them back together and look at how the parts relate to each other. And now you've got a coherent whole, but it's one that's been explored and analyzed and we can see the different parts and how they relate to each other and how they connect to each other. So that's what philosophy is, is supposed to be doing, looking at something, looking at human thinking, looking perhaps at some particular topic, looking at how we analyze that, what are the ideas behind the concept that we use, what do those concepts mean, and then when we kind of broken down all those little bits and looked at all the separate concepts, looking at the connections between them and how they relate to each other. So that may seem a little vague at this point. It'll get a little bit clearer once we start actually doing more philosophy and you can see it in action. But if you think philosophy is vague, where do we get to religion? Religion is perhaps even harder to define because religion is something that people take so personally. People tend to define their own faith as religion. And anything that deviates from their own religion, they call it a cult. Or if it's harmless and feckless enough, it's a philosophy. Um, one story I think of a lot as a news story from the 1990s about ethical humanism, which is defined as a religion, but it's a non-theistic religion. And they applied for tax-exempt status in the state of Texas, and they were turned down, even though as far as the Supreme Court of our nation is concerned, ethical humanism is considered a religion. In the state of Texas, they declared that to be a religion, you have to believe in God. They just looked at the dictionary. That was the dictionary definition. This is what they went with, which rules out many forms of Buddhism. So presumably the Dalai Lama is not a religious leader in Texas and would not qualify for tax-exempt status if he were to try to practice his religion there. Whereas a prosperity preacher with no formal education and a multi-million dollar income can be a religious leader and be tax exempt because he believes in God and he has the DVDs of him saying so to prove it, which you can view for $39.95. At that time, the state comptroller of Texas even went so far as to defend this claim by saying that allowing a non-theistic religion to claim tax-exempt status would be, quote, an insult to our Judeo-Christian heritage. Religion is just a very fuzzy concept, in fact. It's not so simple as just looking at what you see in a dictionary. Dr. Hall says there may be as many definitions of religion as there are cultures. Depending on your definition, 
you may decide communism is a religion, despite the fact that the people who practice it claim to be atheists. You may decide Buddhism and ethical humanism are not religions, despite the claims of their adherents that it is, that they, these are religions, and even court rulings that cite one or both as being religions. Asian cultures typically don't distinguish between religion and philosophy the way Western cultures do. Um, you find Taoism is a religion. Taoism is also a philosophy. Uh, and also, they very often don't distinguish that strongly between religion versus social rituals. Um, Chinese religion traditionally would have rituals to honor the spirit in the well that gives you water and rituals to honor the headman of the village who ordered the well dug in the first place. So all of these rituals and all of these practices, they had words for those. Uh, it said that the Chinese language didn't even have a separate word for religion until Western missionaries came over and started talking about religion and wanting to know what their religion was. I don't speak Chinese, so I'll have to take some their word for that. And then there are other groups, such as Santeria or Wicca, that are treated by religion as religions by their adherents, and their adherents find them spiritually meaningful. But as far as many others are concerned, these are just magic systems. And magic is not religion except apparently when it is. So Harry Potter series are banned from many school libraries because local parents complained that they were attacking religion and offering a false religion that challenged the one true faith. So how are we going to define religion? Dr. Hall discusses two different approaches for this. The essential versus the family resemblance. The essential approach is to try to define religion by some core meaning or essence. What is a thing? It is what it is. Religion is something that has these characteristics, the necessary and sufficient conditions to call anything a religion. He says this is kind of the, in philosophy, the platonic approach. Plato would say that every definable thing has its own essence. And to know a thing is to know what that essence is. What that, what's the idea behind this particular thing? There's some sort of ideal or normative standard that defines so for religion to be a religion, it would have to correspond to this ideal type. Now there's a problem with this. There are several problems with this approach. One is that you can't let it be too narrow or you'll knock out things that our common sense just tells us are religion, such as, again, Tibetan Buddhism. Any of us who have seen Tibetan Buddhists seen monks practicing their rituals, listened to the Dalai Lama teaching, any of those would say that's a religion. Except perhaps if that means you have to worship a god because Buddhism does not worship gods. It's about humans pursuing their own salvation according to spiritual principles. Now, if your definition is too broad so that you make sure you don't leave anybody out, then it's useless as a definition. And often the core meaning may reflect more about the speaker than it does about the religion itself. I attended a lecture once by Dr. Richard Rorty, a philosopher at the University of Virginia, 
who defined religion as the desire to see your enemies burn in hell while you rejoice in heaven. The Marxist calls religion the opiate of the masses. But some other definitions of religion that I've seen used in religion textbooks and such would make Marxism itself to be a religion. Not all religions believe in hell. Not all religions make eternal judgment an important part of their faith. Um, particularly if you look through history at, the, at ancient religions, uh, Baal worship and much other Near and Middle Eastern religion was about placating the gods so that they would bless you in this life. Uh, many shamanistic faiths are very similar in that regard. They don't talk as much about final judgment as they do about the here and now and placating spiritual forces so that they will bless you now. For that matter, uh, if you look at the New Testament, the Sadducees don't seem to believe in an afterlife. The, uh, the book of Acts says that the Sadducees don't believe in spirits or angels or any of those things. Um, they believe, the Sadducees, from what we can tell from history, believed in following the Torah so that God would bless the nation of Israel in this world. So there wasn't so much of a heaven and hell kind of dichotomy going there as, it was, as there was for, say, the Christians or the Pharisees. So this idea of trying to find an, an essence that defines all religion is really very, very fraught, which is why many scholars prefer this method of family resemblance. Define religion in terms of how the word is used by religious people. There'll be certain common traits, but just like in a real family, not everyone looks like everyone else. Um, you know, in my own family, a lot of the males have this thing going, but not necessarily everyone. Uh, some of us have similar hair, but not everyone has the same color hair, uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, this roots deeply in the 20th century philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein and his theory of language, which he called the game theory, or it's called the game theory. And he described how language is rooted in human practices. And if you want to know what a word means, you look at how it's being used by the people who use it. So re religious words would be the sorts of things that religious people say, and what do they mean by those words? and look at their actions when they see some when they say something in much and in he would say in just the same way that medical language has its own rules or scientific language has its own rules versus poetic language has its own rules so Every human practice has its own rules, has its own what's a legitimate move, what's an illegitimate move, and it's kind of like understanding games. Um, you can even use the concept of a game to explain game theory. Uh, what is a game? Uh, well, you have to have two sides competing. No. Dungeons and Dragons is a game. There's multiple players, and they're all cooperating. Uh, well, it has to have some sort of a goal. Well, the oldest game in the world is the hoop and stick. You have a hoop and you make it roll by hitting it with a stick. People play this all around the world. Uh, there's no written rules. There's no point to the game except to play the game. It's not competitive. Um, 
It's very, very, very hard to find a single definition, but you know it when you see it because of this family resemblance. So he mentions what he says are five characteristics that most religions share. So you might find a religion that's lacking one or two of these, but if something's lacking all of them, it's not a religion. He says a religion, he defines it as a system of beliefs with certain components. They tend to be all-inclusive about the world. When the religion says something, it tends to be sweeping. It doesn't just say, this is true for this little corner. It says, the world is like this. Religion claims, tends to claim preeminence. The religious judgment is supposed to be somehow a judgment that is above the craftsman or the lawyer or whatever. Uh, it's a benchmark by which other beliefs are measured. We don't, uh, the lawyer who is a Christian might be questioned, is the way you're practicing your law office really consistent with your religion? Are you being a Christian lawyer? Very rarely will we criticize a Christian for not being enough of a lawyer. But you might criticize the lawyer who claims to be a Christian lawyer for not being enough of a Christian. So there's a sense of prioritizing, at least for believers, prioritizing the judgments of the religion over others. There's usually some supernatural dimension to a religion, something beyond the material and the sensory. It often includes a supreme being, such as God or gods. Again, not always, uh, but generally. There's usually some sort of a afterlife, and there's usually, along with that afterlife, some sort of a judgment, an idea that the quality of your afterlife is going to be dictated or heavily influenced by how you lived this life. Now, again, not every religion has all of these, and some of them might have an idea of judgment without an idea of afterlife, or vice versa. Now, mostly, and this is probably because he's coming at this from a philosophical perspective, Mostly he's focusing on concepts or notions, not on religious practices and rituals and community. But he does discuss this as well as an important part of religion. So some would define religion almost exclusively as a communal practice and say that to be religious is not just to have certain beliefs, but to live in response to those beliefs which has, means worship, it means rituals, and it may also mean moral and ethical implications. Often, there's some sort of institution, some sort of hierarchy, but not always. And there's often a religious community and social life, uh, church, but there's also private spiritual life, uh, for Christians, that would be like prayer, private meditation, fasting perhaps, uh, reading scripture by oneself. None of the, no one would really say that, well, these things don't have anything to do with a religious community, so they're not valid. Clearly, these are religious practices. So, and sometimes historically, you can even have sort of a conflict between this official public versus this private religion. You see, you see this a lot, particularly in the Middle Ages, in conflicts between papal authority versus the teachings of some mystic who was perhaps, you know, just living out in a cell or in the woods or whatever, but teaching people or writing and claiming a direct relationship with the divine, 
not mediated by the institutions. Religion also, religion also generates artifacts, cultural artifacts, religious songs, religious art, religious architecture, things of that sort. So religions have many shared characteristics, but not every religion has all of those characteristics. And in this course, we're going to end up focusing on one particular kind of religion, and that's going to be ethical monotheism. And briefly, ethical monotheism, mono is one God, no more, no less. And ethical implies both that that God is good and that that God wants us to be good and has a definition of good that is an important part of the religion. But we'll discuss that more often, or we'll discuss that again later. So we've got philosophy asking these meta questions. We've got a definition or a at least a vague definition of religion. So what is philosophy of religion? Lecture three in Dr. Hall's series. Now again, first he starts by saying what it is not. It is not comparative religion. It is not apologetics, which is the defense of the faith against attacks. It is not even religious philosophy. And it is not, as some people seem to think it is, using philosophy to attack religion or to replace religion. Philosophy of religion is asking these meta questions about religion. It is about analyzing religious concepts, examining how religious thought works, what assumptions religious people make when they talk about religion or do religious things like worship and so on. Now, Dr. Hall's specialty is epistemology. This is the philosophical understanding of knowledge. Epistemology examines what does it mean when we say something is true, or how do we know what is true? How do we recognize it? What's the difference between knowledge versus opinion? So Dr. Hall is focusing primarily on religious knowledge. What can we know about our religion? What can we know about God? What has to be true for the sorts of things that religious people claim to actually be true? And again, he's looking primarily at ethical monotheism. So we're not going to be looking too much, too much at non-theistic religions. We're not going to be looking at polytheistic religions very much. We're going to be focusing primarily on the kind of religion that as a citizens of the United States of America, we are most familiar with. This idea that there's one God, that God is good, that God wants us created beings to be good as well. Now you can find religion, almost any kind of religion in this country. More than one God, no gods, everything is God, it's all one kind of pantheistic thing. There's all sorts of possible spiritualities out there. But we're going to be mostly focusing on ethical monotheism. And this is the dominant form of religion in this country, and it's so dominant that even atheists tend to assume that's religion. Uh, they reject ethical monotheism, but what they are rejecting is defined in ethical monotheistic terms. And 